Uh, we, some friends of ours, had all these life journals that uh, they had left over, and so they gave them to us. So there's a bunch of them back there. If you'd like one, take them. They're pretty self-explanatory. There's, I think, three different Bible reading plans in there. One's as simple as just doing a chapter a day. If maybe you're just trying to start the year off and you say, I want to read the Bible every day, and, and you, know, you, you know that if I try too much, it's probably going to happen. But you go, okay, I could probably do a chapter a day. And then you journal. And, and so it's a, it's a great tool, uh, beneficial, just to really allow God's Word to speak to you, to apply it to our lives. Because one of the things that um, is interesting, anybody want this one? All right, there you go. <laughs> um, is we have a lot of people that will study the Bible. And in fact, in you know, sort of the academic world, we have the Harvard Divinity School over here, and there are people there that will study the Bible and they have no uh, understanding because they don't believe it's true. So they have not allowed the Holy Spirit, which Scripture tells us is the revealer of truth. So all they do is they study it as a book of history or a book of literature, a, a book of apocalyp apocalyptic writings. And, and so they get some sense of knowledge from it, but they miss the whole purpose. But as those that are believers, it says that when we ask Christ to come into our life, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So we have the very same tool, if you will, the Holy Spirit that Jesus himself had. Every theologian. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but you might pick up your Bible and, and you read, and then the sides are in the bottom. There's all these notes that, you know, some theologians have written their ideas of what that scripture means. I, when I was in seminary, I had a professor, and it was in uh, our biblical interpretation class, which it was a phenomenal class. And this guy had such a love for the Word of God. He, he, was, he was amazing. He did a Master's of Divinity and a Doctorate of Divinity um, while working full-time, married with kids in school, and he did the whole thing in six years, which is remarkable in anybody's book. But this guy, he was really, really smart, but he had such a love. I mean, you could not be around this guy and not be excited to study God's Word. And, and the first day of class, I, I, I remember it so clearly, he said... I want you all to understand something. You are theologians. He says, what's a theologian? A theologian is someone that studies to know God. And he said, you have the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that every theologian who has ever walked on this earth had. So who's to say they know what they're talking about? That's their interpretation, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. Maybe they wasn't the Holy Spirit, maybe it was just themselves. But he said, I don't want to hear what any theologian other than you has to say about the Scripture. He says, if you bring up, well, this is what it says in my Bible, he goes, you won't like what you see. He goes, I want to hear what God speaks to you. And he like drilled that into our head. And there's a few times, like somebody, I guess they forgot that, and they, you know, reading their Bible and says, well, you know, it says here in this commentary, and, and he would get, not like crazy mad, but he would get mad. He said, no, I told you, I don't want to hear what somebody else says. Now that's great. And after you read scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his word to you, fine, go and look at other sources. And, I, and it so challenged me. And, it, and to this day, when I go to scripture, when I'm reading for myself, when I'm preparing for sermons, I don't go and look at what anybody else has to say. And I don't do that out of pride or arrogance, but I do and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me? Then what do you want to say to us? Because quite frankly, the Holy Spirit knows you better than I do. He knows me better than I do. Some theologian that wrote a commentary 50, 60 years ago doesn't know me at all. And again, it's not to say what he wrote is wrong, but understand you have the Holy Spirit yourself. So when you go to Scripture, pray, say, Holy Spirit, I need your word because it says it's life to my bones and to my spirit. I need to know today. And when you have something like a life journal, then you say, wow, what, what really popped out to me? What just sort of like grabbed me in my spirit as I was reading that? 
And then you say, Holy Spirit, how does that apply to my life? Because this is the cool thing about God. God doesn't ever just say things because he's God. I mean, he could because he's God, right? But he always says stuff and how it applies to our life. Always. He is always about how we live what we learn. Somebody once said that the American church is educated way beyond our obedience. In other words, we know a lot more than we do. James put it this way, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers as well. So anyway, that was, uh, that was just a freebie. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, man, that guy, he, he really uh, affected my life in that class. Uh, and not so much because of the content, but because of his love for the Word of God. I've never known anybody that, I've never known anybody that just knew the Word of God and it didn't come out as an academic uh, teaching, it came out as life. He would just go, well, let me give you a running commentary. And he would just start talking about Scripture. And he would just like, bam, 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 bam. And you're just like on the edge of your seat because of the passion and the excitement that he had. May we have that passion. Uh, if you weren't with us last week and we were, it was a smaller group, you know, we know these first few weeks going in January, we've got people that are coming back and still people traveling and whatnot. But I would encourage you to go and listen to the message because the overriding idea was God wants to bring spiritual revolution in our life. And what is one thing that we can believe God to do in our life this year that will bring revolution? And to just say, for this year, this is the thing I'm going to believe. If God, if I let you do this in my life, it will change me and it will change everybody around me. Not to get a list of 10, not to get a list of 20, but one thing. What is one thing that I can believe God and say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask you to give me the strength to walk in the way I need to walk for that to happen. To see revolution happen in my life. Well, one of the things that I'm excited with that, it's starting Tuesday night. We're doing it. It's called Operation Solid Lives. It's a, an amazing uh, discipleship program, which, oh, by the way, I don't think I ever answered your email, did I? <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll talk to you later. Um, and it's, it's five weeks long. It starts this Tuesday. It goes for five weeks. And it's going to be amazing. If you can, you know, set five weeks aside on Tuesday nights, I'd encourage you to be a part. You can still sign up. We've got 10 people signed up. We can fit a couple more in there. Um, it's $25 for the materials. And it's five weeks that I believe will change our lives. Because here's why. Two things. One, the Word of God, and allowing the Spirit of God to bring it in, to life in, in, within us. And the other one is, is we're going to challenge you, man. Tuesday night, uh, some of you that have signed up, you may go, whoa, I don't know if I signed up for this. Because it's going to ask you to make some serious decisions to let Christ and His Word rule in your life. And, and it's going to be exciting because it means we're going to cut out a lot of the stuff that brings every influence except God's into our lives. So that's going to be a challenge. I know it's going to be a challenge for me. I'm sure it'll be a challenge for all of us. But if you're interested, there's some information on the table. You can let me know if you, you'd like to be a part. And it starts on Tuesday. The part of this whole... Uh, can we put the slide up there for uh, revolution? This is kind of the overriding idea. Revolution. Hear, listen, obey. In February, as I was praying through this last year, it was like early November, I felt like God said we're supposed to have 21 days of prayer and fasting uh, starting in February. So this, this month, we're uh, preparing for revolution. It's going to start today, and that's the next three weeks, well, four weeks including today, we're going to be talking about Preparing for revolution. What does that mean? To prepare for revolution in my life. For those around me. And part of that is we're going to do 21 days of prayer and fasting. But this is what I'm excited about. Because as I was praying, I felt like God said we were going to do something radical. And, and here's, here's actually, I wasn't going to talk. Some of the definitions for revolution are a drastic action or change. A sudden, complete, or marked change in something. 
a radical and pervasive change in society. God is radical. Now, not by his own terms, but he's supernatural. And we call it supernatural, but to him it's just natural. You do understand that God doesn't do things out of his nature. It's not above his nature, it just is his nature. It's just above our nature, so we call it supernatural. But that's the way God moves. I mean, he doesn't think it's a big deal to speak and a world shows up. He doesn't think it's a big deal to speak and somebody who's dead rises up. He doesn't think that's a big deal at all because he has what? All power. He's omnipotent. But he calls us at times to do things that are radical by our standards. Now, I'm kind of a radical person, or at least I used to be. I don't know what happened to me. I kind of got uh, domesticated, and that's not because of getting married and having kids. It happened somewhere along the line. You just sort of find out that, you know, I, I was always the guy that was kind of edgy, and I'm not really so edgy anymore. I don't, I don't, you know, it's like I still like adrenaline. I like those things, but I'm not, I'm not real radical. Now, some people still think I am, which is kind of funny, because that just tells you how boring they really are. But, but I always, I liked to do things that were radical. I liked to do things that would surprise people. And over the years, I did some. I remember one time I decided, this is years and years ago, to freak my mom out. I was away uh, for a couple of weeks. I came back. I was, how old was I? I was probably 18. And I, I pierced my ear up in the top part of my ear. This is a long time ago. This is 30 some years ago. And my mom wasn't real impressed, but it definitely got a shock out of her. But she actually didn't show it because she knew that that was what I was aiming for. So I did some stupid things over the years that uh, were for that value. But God calls us to do things that are radical because it affects the spiritual realm. And that's what we desire to see. See, God doesn't really care so much about what's happening here. He cares about what's happening up there. And we're going to talk about that more today and in the next few weeks, because it affects everything that goes on here. Many times we get played by the devil and his little minions because we're only focused on what we can see. And God says, keep your eyes and your mind on heaven so that you'll actually be aware of what's going on. Because again, we're going to talk about it in a minute here, but we know, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, that our battle's not against flesh and blood. How many of you, though, you get angry at people? People do stuff, and you get ticked off. You get upset. You get hurt. You get offended. You get betrayed. All these things. Why? Because of people. But people are not our enemy. Never have been, never will be. We can make them the enemy, but they never are. But it's the spirits that are at work behind them. And so many times we're focused in the wrong place. It's kind of like a magician. You know, a magician, sleight of hand. They get you looking over here, and they do something over here, and you're like, whoa, how did that happen? And Satan is the king of it all. He wants to get us focused in the things that we see and feel and think, and that's the center of it all. And God says, no, 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 no. We can actually live above all those things. Is that hard? Well, yeah, it is. So what's the radical thing? Well, I believe that at the end of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, so I think it will be uh, February 3rd, so the 17th. So starting February 18th, which is a Monday, we know that our whole mission is not Harvard, but we understand that it is the heart of something that God wants to do because of what it represents, not just the students there, but because of what it represents in history, in culture, in every way, spiritually. So we're going to, whoever's willing to be crazy with me and can, we're going to meet Monday morning at 7, and we're going to walk all the way around Harvard and pray. And then we're going to meet on Tuesday, and we're going to walk all the way around Harvard and pray. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you can see where I'm going. And then on that last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, which will be February 24th, we're going to meet early, and we're going to walk around seven times. And Lord willing, we will be in Holton Chapel. Maybe not. We'll see what happens. But wherever we are, we will gather 
And we are going to believe as in Jericho, which was a physical manifestation of what God was doing spiritually, that we are going to see a spiritual manifestation of God breaking down the strongholds that have ruled in that place for a really long time. And you look and say, well, who are we? Hey, we're, we're just people who are crazy enough to believe God to be God. If you look at the bottom of this, it says, let it begin here. Anybody know where that comes from? Any good historians of uh, Massachusetts, American Revolution? If you've ever, who's ever been to the Lexington Green? Lexington, Massachusetts, down the street, about 40 minutes. If you've not been, you should go. It's the first skirmish of the American Revolution. There was a man by the name of Captain John Parker. He was a pastor and the head of the 77 militiamen in Lexington, Massachusetts. And on April 19, 1775, they stood in the green of Lexington with the British troops opposite them, them standing there, all 77 of them, normal men, but committed to an ideal that was bigger than themselves. And he made this statement. Let me find it, because I'm kind of going in a different direction. Okay. And you, if you go there, you'll see this monument, this little granite monument. And this is what he is supposed to have said. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. I believe that we are in a spiritual war. And as we're going to see as we read in Ephesians 6, that one of the things that Paul challenges is, is when you have done everything, stand. He says, stand your ground. But if the enemy wants a war, then let it begin here. May we be willing to stand and say, it's not a war against flesh and blood. It is a war against principalities and powers in high places. And we are going to stand. We are going to stand in a world that says it's all about what I feel, sense, smell, touch. We're going to say, no, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. Let it begin here. We feel that our calling, and this was something I felt God showed me um, a number of years ago, is pretty simple. That we would be a place where we're grounded in His Word and empowered by His Spirit. Because the nature of man is we like to go to extremes. In fact, typically when someone is one extreme and they kind of realize it's an extreme, they swing the pendulum to the other side and go to the other extreme. What do you mean? Well, somebody who's a drug addict, an alcoholic, they often, when they realize they have an issue and they get sober, they often will come clear to the other side and they become extremely legalistic. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody, but I've watched it happen to many. They go the polar opposite. Their life was completely out of control, and then everything is about control. Somebody once said, all word you dry up, all spirit you blow up, word and spirit you grow up. We're called to be a place where we know the word of God, the word of God is in us, and we allow the Holy Spirit of God to work it in and through us. So what's a revolution? Well, I told you what some of the definitions are. So what's the revolution I'm talking about? Well, I mentioned these verses last week. Many of us know them out of Luke chapter 4. Jesus rode, re, picked up the scroll in the synagogue, the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the kind of revolution we're talking about. I mean, is that what our world needs to see? The oppressed set free, the blind seeing, the favor of the Lord upon us. It means 
living in the Spirit and not the flesh. Walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. It tells us in Galatians that walk according to the Spirit and not so that you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In other words, the selfish desires of our natural flesh. Following Jesus and His plan for our lives. What we were just talking about earlier. Surrendering everything. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a pretty radical idea. Because we oftentimes read the Bible and go, yeah, that doesn't really work. I mean, that sounds good, but you can't live that way in the real world. Come on! Be a person of integrity. Well, it'll cost you. Be a person who stands up for Christ more than yourself. Who defends those that can't defend themselves. What does it mean to live a life that's truly led by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I haven't done it yet. I'm working on it. I'm saying, Lord, help me to live there. I believe we can do it because Jesus said we could. God doesn't tell us that we can do things if it's not possible. Now, it's not easy, and it's certainly not natural. But what would happen? What would happen? If we actually lived every day, surrendering every moment, every decision, everything that we did in every part of every day to the Spirit of God. You go, well, that's, a, that's crazy. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. But that's actually what we're called to do. He said we should pray without ceasing. Again, walk according to the Spirit and not the flesh, because the flesh and the Spirit are contrary to one another. And if I'm making decisions just based on my own logic and what seems good to me, it doesn't mean they're bad, but they're certainly not going to be of God. American Christians, we have a way of making decisions and asking God to bless them. I've been guilty of that so many times in my life. Say, well, it seems like this is right. Well, you know what? That was the problem in Noah's day. Every man, every woman did what was right in their own eyes. We just ask God to bless it. What would happen if we actually said, God, to the best of my ability, empowered by your spirit, I'm going to surrender every day to you. And as I'm walking through the day, okay, Lord, where do you want me to go to eat lunch? You go, come on. God really care where you eat lunch? Yeah, he does, because he cares about people's eternity. And he may have somebody for you at that place that desperately needs to know how much Jesus loves them, that they're not going to be over there. I don't know about you, but there have been times where I made a right-hand turn and I ran into somebody. I was planning to go that way, and I went that way, and I ran into somebody, and it was totally God. What if I live my life that way every day? So it's not odd, it's not unusual, but it's actually a norm. That's pretty radical. That is a revolution in how I live. And I believe that's what God wants to do. I believe that He wants to take us and so transform us that it will change everybody around us. Why? Because if I'm actually living my life following God's call, when He says, stop, I stop, I've mentioned this many times before. If you read about the miracles of Jesus, almost every one of them was an interruption. Almost every one of them were not on His agenda. The woman grabbed his robe, him of his rope, and he stopped and he said, who touched me? said, he's on his way here and somebody stops and says, hey, my daughter's sick. The blind man interrupts him over and over and over again. How many times does God interrupt my day and I don't let him? He has an encounter to see my life, someone else's lives changed, transformed, and I don't let him because I got my agenda. My agenda is more important than his. Notice the three little words. I just mentioned them briefly below revolution. Hear, listen, and obey. I believe this is the foundation of spiritual revolution. It's the same for my three-year-old as it is for us. You can hear and not listen. Trust me, he does it often. You can listen and not obey. 
He'll tell me, Daddy, I'm listening. Yeah, buddy, but you're not obeying. See, the word comes out of the Hebrew, Shema, which means to obey, but it's actually this process to hear, to listen, and to obey. That we would hear the word of God, we would listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and we would do it. Is it difficult? Well, not to understand. Is it confusing? Well, I don't, I don't think so. Is it really complicated? No. Is it really hard to do? Well, yes. Because it's contrary to my flesh. The most fundamental thing that we teach children is to obey. I, I wish my son, he's an amazing kid, but he's a strong-willed child, probably just like his dad. I wish that he would obey. Because it's not only better on him, it's better on me. It's better on his mom. We don't like to discipline him. And I try to tell him that, and I try to help him understand that. But how many times does God try to help us understand that? How many times do we get ourselves in situations? He's all the time getting himself hurt because he didn't listen and obey. All the time. You're like, how many times have we told you not to jump off the back of the couch? But sometimes he does, I mean, he does it often, but he, he does it and he, he, you know, he does something and he hurts himself. But how many times have I brought pain into my life because I was not, I was not hearing, I wasn't listening, I certainly wasn't obeying. It's a simple, simple thing. Obedience. As we embark on this adventure, this journey, this revolution, we have to understand that the foundations and the basis for spiritual revolution in our lives is this simple process. Hear, listen, and obey. You can't hear something that you're not paying attention to. You can't listen if you're not actively engaged, and you can't obey if you haven't surrendered. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's all about us submitting to God. See, at the end of the day, the reason that my son may not obey me is because somewhere in his own little mind, he decides that his way is better than mine. And that's what we do with God. See, the difference is he's three. And he's learning. But God says... Man, i got such amazing things I desire for your life. I have so many people that I want to see changed and transformed through the life that's been transformed in you. But it can't happen by wishing. You know, there's a lot of things in my life I've wished would happen. I mean, I wish I was a professional athlete. I will never. I mean, obviously I'm way past the age of any professional athlete, but even when I was younger. Why? Well, some of it you could say was talent, but more than that, it was discipline. It was commitment. There are many times in our walk with Christ, we desire something, but we won't actually make the choices to do it. Hear, listen, obey. I'm going to, wow, looking at the time. That was, that was a longer introduction than I and planned, but it's good. I'm, I'm not going to get into the whole, I'm going to read Ephesians 6. Many of us know these verses, 10 through 20. I'm going to read the verses, say a couple things, and then we'll finish for today. But I want to encourage you. Ask God and then make the choices to surrender to Him every day. It'll take multiple times through the day because I don't know about you, but, but my mind is always going all sorts of different directions and I start making decisions about things without even thinking. Now, most of them you might say, well, they're little things. Well, are they? I mean, the problem is we don't know what's little and big. I get those confused all the time. I look back in my life and I thought certain things that happened were going to be life-altering and they weren't. 
Other things I thought they weren't a big deal and they affected my whole life. And sometimes it's about someone else. See, there are times where our listening and obeying may change someone else's life for eternity. That's a really big deal. And it may not seem like a big deal to you, but it will be a really big deal to them. I can look back in my life and see people that took those moments and it changed me. So let's read these verses together. Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, you can take one up off the floor. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read from verse 10 uh, through verse 20. And then we're going to take the next few weeks unpackaging all of this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now understand, this is at the end of the letter that Paul has written to the church in Ephesus. And he's saying, finally. What does finally mean? Finally means... He's getting to the end. So he's saying, basically, here's the last thing I want you to know. Finally, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to, what? Stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. As we prepare ourselves for a revolution, a drastic change, a radical and pervasive change in our lives and the society around us. Now, we're not coming out to pick it. We're not going to, you know, pick up guns and go after people. We're going to fall on our knees. We're going to dig into the Word of God. We're going to live life surrendered to Him that will be so radical that people will just go, what in the world has happened to you? But there are some things that have to happen. We have to decide if we actually want to be a part of a revolution. I mean, do we want God to turn, as I say, if we sing the song Inside Out, I say Jesus wants to work from the inside out to turn your world right side up. All the time we talk about our world being upside down, but God wants to turn our world right side up. But some of us don't really want God to turn our world right side up because it means then He's the one that's in charge and I'm not. And if I'm honest, there are certainly times in my life I did not want Him to be in charge. Not of every area of my life. I might say, okay, God, you, you can have those ones. I'll take care of these ones. God said, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. What does it look like to allow the Spirit of God to revolutionize your life in Him? See, it's not about a bunch of rules. It's not a bunch of lists. See, that's the hard thing of walking in the Spirit is it's constantly adapting because the Holy Spirit calls audibles all the, all the time. If you don't know where that term comes from, if you watch football, quarterbacks will make audibles, which means they get up to the line of scrimmage and just before they hike the ball and they, they begin the play, they look at the defense and they see something and they change the play right there on the spot. They call them make an audible. They change everything. 
And see, really good quarterbacks have the ability to see things that no one else on the team sees. We have the Holy Spirit. He knows everything. He says, as we're walking through our day, he looks, he goes, whoa, wait a minute. The enemy changed tactics. I got a better plan. Let's go over here. He's calling an audible. He says, man, go this way. Satan's not going to be ready for that one. And somebody's life has changed. See, we're talking about eternity and eternal things, which are far bigger than our own hopes and dreams. And there's nothing wrong with hopes and dreams. Trust me, I, I've had dreams my whole life, and I've seen God do some amazing things. But I would rather see God do one thing through my life that will impact somebody's eternity than see all kinds of things happen through my life that only make me look better. Are we willing to live that kind of a radical life? And honestly, it's not a radical life, really. It's actually what Jesus said a disciple would do. He says, if you want to be my disciple, here's the equation. Take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. That's what we're talking about. I hate denying myself. I like to get my own way. I like to do what Chris likes to do. When I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about me. Don't look at me like that. You are thinking about yourself too. It's the way we are. It's not supposed to be radical. But it is radical because we have gotten so accustomed to making God in our image. See, we want to make God fit into our world. And we kind of, you know, he's kind of like an addendum. He's not the center. I think everybody knows what a bike tire looks like, right? In the center, there's the hub and there's the spokes. If you remove the hub of the wheel, what happens? The wheel collapses. That's supposed to be where Christ is. Christ is so supposed to be in the center of our life to such a degree that if I were to remove him, my life would collapse. Andrew Murray, I believe it was, that... Uh, oh, no, it wasn't Andrew Murray. Uh, who was it? Yeah, um, one of the... Uh, he, he's, he's a very prolific uh, Christian writer. But he said, in the early church, if you took and removed the Holy Spirit from the church, 95% of what they did would have ceased to exist. But today, in the church, if you were to remove the Holy Spirit, 95% of what we do would continue. That's shocking. And, but unfortunately, probably is very true. And it's probably true in our life because we get so accustomed to doing so many things without God. What would happen if we were so radical to actually believe what Jesus said? To do what Jesus said? To strive to be his disciples. Jesus says, some people are going to think I'm crazy. You know what? Some people probably think you're crazy already. Wouldn't you rather have them think you're crazy because you love Jesus? Now, I'm not saying be an idiot. You know, some people are idiots. God doesn't call us to be idiots. He does call us to be foolish. And understand there's a difference. Because I've done a lot of idiotic things in my life, and that's only on me. But I've also done some foolish things that were for God's sake, and you know what? It wasn't about me, but it was about his kingdom. And God, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 1, says he takes the foolish things to shame the wise. So if you want to make the wise people look bad, be God's fool. You want to make the really strong people look bad? Be weak in God's eyes. Humble. Broken. A broken and a contrite heart God will never turn away. This is what we're talking about. What does it look like for us to live that kind of life? Well, it's going to be messy. Because we're going to not figure it out every day. 
and I'm going to mess up some days. I say, Lord, thank you that your mercies are new every morning. I get a fresh start tomorrow. Lord, help me to follow you better tomorrow, to hear, to listen, and to obey. If we strive to do that in the power of God's Spirit, our world will be different. I guarantee it. It's better than men's warehouse guarantee, I'll tell you that much. Because God's Word is true. And it does work in the real world. It doesn't work the way man wants it to work. It's not always going to feel good. It's not always going to look good. I'm not going to promise you that you're always going to come up on top in the world's eyes, but you will come out on top in God's eyes. And they're not always the same. But we have to be willing to be diminished in the eyes of men that we may be lifted up in the eyes of God. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads for a minute? You know, one of the things that I feel God has put in my, my spirit, and it's kind of, again, it's, part of, it's kind of radical, and I, I guess I kind of like that. I like earlier when uh, we found out we were getting kicked out of Holden Chapel today, we didn't know where we were going, and then, you know, God opened it up for us to be here. And I was, you know, I wasn't angry, but I was just kind of like, oh, man, God, what's up with that? And I love John's response. He says, Man, I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting because, you know, you're starting a series on revolution, and it sure sounds like, uh, like Satan's taking it serious. <laughs> he, he doesn't want us to continue as we've been going. And I thought, wow, that's, that's the right heart. Is that when, because here's the truth. If we make a decision and say, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to be your disciple. I'm going to strive with your help to deny myself, to take up my cross and follow after you, to hear, listen, and obey. I guarantee you all hell will break loose in your life. Stuff will happen that you've never even imagined to happen. Because the enemy doesn't want you to be that kind of Christian. He's okay with you being a Christian who shows up in church. You know, you're a nice person. Don't really ruffle anybody's feather. Don't really talk about Jesus much. Don't bring it into your day-to-day -day life. He's okay with that. But the minute that we say we're going to live the way God has called us to live, we're going to strive to surrender ourselves to Him and His plan for our lives, He doesn't like that. Because He knows if you do that, it will change your life, and it will change the lives of others around you because they're going to see Jesus in everything you do. So understand, if you take this challenge, it's not my challenge, it's his challenge, you will come under attack. Because let me tell you, we are in a war. But here's the key. It says, we're more than conquerors. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That Jesus made a public spectacle of Satan, and he has been defeated. And it says, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So as we end this time together today, I want you to ask yourself in your heart, am I ready to be a revolutionary for God. To be so radical in my surrender to Him, my willingness to obey Him, to hear His voice, to listen to His voice, and to obey it, that I'll see His will done here in my life as it is in heaven. Because Jesus didn't ask us to pray that because it was an insane prayer. He asked us to pray it that it would happen. And again, it will happen if we let it happen. Because what happens in heaven, God's will happens all the time. So we get to choose, will we let His will happen in our lives and through our lives? Lord God, I, I pray for each of us. God, I'm, I'm excited as we embark on this adventure together. Because I believe this is what it's all about. 
seeing your kingdom come and your will be done. We're called to be servants in your kingdom, not the kingdom of this world, not the kingdom of our own making, but in your kingdom, to give up our rights and follow you. So Lord, may we continually surrender ourselves to you. Because Lord, we believe that in doing so, as your word says, as you said, Jesus, we'll find our life. But Lord, if we hold on to it, we'll lose it. So God, I pray for us. The Lord, we will go into this year excited, but prepared. Even as Paul says here, be alert. Be aware of the devil's schemes. We're going to talk about some of those next week. That we would be aware. That know the enemy's coming after us if we decide to follow you full out. But God, you give us all the tools we need. It says Jesus already defeated him, so all we have to do is stand in what you've already done. That we are set free. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are called. So Lord, I pray for us that something would stir deep within us. Your Holy Spirit would rise up. The dunamis power of God's Spirit would rise up in us and say, it's time. It's time. Now is the day unto salvation. I'm called to be His witness. I'm called to see His kingdom established in my life, and the world around me. Give us strength, give us grace. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, we're going to get into uh, breaking down Ephesians 6 over the next few weeks.